Thank you for the, the, the very generous uh, and interesting <laughs> introduction. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the science. Right? I, I, um, I, I think for, for many of us who look back over the past 30 to 40 years, it's a, it's a re remarkable period of scientific advance in, in many areas in molecular biology, largely through the, a combination of the, the new uh, molecular DNA-based techniques, combining them with uh, genetics and also the, uh, the potential to visualize molecules in cell, living molecules in cells. So our understanding of most biological processes has uh, gone un undergone an enormous transformation. That's, I think, particularly true in our understanding of embryonic development, which is the area that I've worked on in most, for most of my life. And that's what I'm going to uh, uh, focus my talk on today. I, um, my own early interest in embryos came from, uh, from the obvious visual impact, that you can look at embryos. And uh, this is a fly embryo during the early cleavage divisions. Embryos have to do certain things. They start off as a single cell, and they undergo a series of synchronous mitotic divisions to produce in flies, ultimately, a blastoderm. They pause in their cell cycle when the number reaches 6,000. They activate gene expression to uh, establish specific fates in given regions of the embryo. And then immediately, different regions begin to uh, fold, uh, uh, behave differently. Some cells will divide. Uh, uh, specific places, cells will divide. Folds will form. Morphogenetic movements will occur. Uh, I could, and maybe some of you could watch this movie <laughs> again and again. It is an amazing process, the idea of, of embryonic development. We'll let it, just at least the cleavage division is a, a very remarkable uh, process. Um, the pause. Um, if we, if you go and look at the process in a little bit more detail, um, you can break embryonic development in flies, as you, in, in most organisms, into phases. There's this, an early phase where there's a set of synchronous nuclear replications. These, interestingly, in flies occur without intervening cytokinesis. So you maintain a syncytial embryo up to the point where magically the embryo knows that there's enough cells. It will stop and partition these nuclei into individual cells by uh, generation of plasma membrane between them. It's during this phase that maternal gradients of transcription factors uh, establish distinct cell fates along the axis. These fates are then internalized in terms of the transcriptional responses to establish particular cell types such that when the embryo begins gastrulation, individual cells become uh, uh, directed uh, individual cells that have been directed in to form specific organs begin to do specific things, like the mesodermal cells you can see here. Now, I'm going to focus this talk it, to a certain extent on the mechanics of these early cleavage divisions, the cell cycle control, and how this cell cycle control is integrated into a pattern of gene expression. Because the embryo wants to do two things. It actually wants to activate gene expression at this stage, after what would, uh, between cycle, around cycle 13, cycle 14, what would be analogous to a mid-blastular transition in other organisms. It wants to activate generalized transcription. And there are going to be processes in the embryo that are going to be associated with general transcriptional activation. But simultaneously, with these changes in the cell cycle and activation, there's a process where a relatively small number of genes, and the particular example I'm, I'm showing you here is the bicoid transcription factor that is, a great, is supplied as a RNA localized at the anterior end of the embryo, produces a gradient of this transcription factor that specifically activates particular genes 
in particular regions along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo. So one of the things I, uh, depending on the, the uh, if we, at the, the time in this talk, I'd like to try to extend this general idea of transcriptional activation and the kinds of, of chromatin and, 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 and developmental uh, epigenetic changes that have to occur here to encompass how it is that these, uh, this, these states of DNA, uh, these states of chromosome, establish at this stage influence and play out on these uh, patterns of the embryo. So that's my basic plan for today. I should say that you guys are the guinea pigs for this talk. Uh, I, um, this is actually my first run through this, and so if I say something really, really confusing, you can kind of stop and wave your hand <laughs> and interrupt, and then I'll, we can go back or go slow. Or so. But my plan basically is what I'd like to do drawings that I gave you, I actually had, have had on my computer for the past five years or six years, or the, and it's a kind of a, now a, a relatively standard view of the problem it's in, uh, uh, fly, in Drosophila development of biology. What I'd like to do is try to re-examine these phenomena and try to get a little bit closer to the underlying molecular biology of each of these transitions. I'm going to focus initially on the timing aspect that is how timing of transcri uh, timing of transcriptional timing <laughs> the timing of transcription uh, uh, transcriptional timing and cell cycle co are coordinated in the uh, context of chromatin uh, dynamics in the embryo and then I'd like to extend that to uh, begin to discuss concentration dependent activation uh, by transcription factors and these are old questions it's not that we're thinking of these questions, but what um, is new for us is the application of strategies that were largely developed by Shelby Blythe, postdoc in the lab, that allows us to apply molecular, standard or, or broadly used molecular technologies, but to use them now on single embryos to follow, and this will allow us to be much more precise in terms of visual staging but also allow us to begin to use specific genotypes and to apply Drosophila genetics to the, the analysis. Now, again, we'll actually start with this concept of a mid blastula transition, which is a, a point in many embryonic developments following the early cleavage divisions where the cell cycle is restructured and change to a different pattern from very, in fly embryos, from a very rapid series of, of cleavage cycles that are about every 10 minutes to a gradual slowdown of the, 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 the cell, uh, cell cycle duration and then a, a pause, actually, for until uh, at cycle 14 and a coordination of that cell, ci of that cell cycle transition with the onset of zygotic transcription. And what is striking about flies, if you look at uh, one of the great constancies in fly embryonic development, and I, is that flies count very well. And the embryo goes through a standard number of 13 cleavages, the wild type normal genetic embryo, and then pauses. And the, this is an extremely reproducible phenomena in, uh, in development. We've entered the MBT, this is cycle 13, go through one more round of division and then pause. The cycles are 10 minutes for, uh, about 10 minutes on average and then extend to 20 minutes and then pause. Now, we wanted to know what, is the, what actually governs this, how is this timing controlled, what coordinates the cell cycle pause and the onset of transcription. This is actually an old problem in developmental biology. Uh, there's two clues, though, that have influenced our, our thinking about it in flies. The first is that if you look at embryos and you genetically manipulate them in a variety of ways, focusing on DNA, uh, uh, fo particularly on DNA 
genes that control components of the DNA replication checkpoint. This is the checkpoint that, allow, that uh, allows entry into mitosis uh, following DNA replication. What's been known since the, uh, for about 10 to 15 years is that this mid, this cell cycle behavior, the slowing down and pause in the cell cycle is dependent on these replication checkpoints. The replication checkpoints are activated and they prevent entry into mitosis or delay entry into mitosis. If you eliminate these uh, checkpoints, for example, in the checkpoint one mutant, what you see is that the cell cycle main is maintained at this shorter 10 minute interval and it actually doesn't pause and eventually undergoes a, catast a catastrophic mitosis. So this, these res results of this kind told us that in some way the checkpoints and presumably DNA replication stress or uh, uh, some, some phenomena associated with DNA replication is involved in controlling, these, controlling this event. The second clue actually uh, extends from work in, uh, you know, broadly in many organisms that show an MBT in frogs and uh, actually back to the uh, kind of Spayman's work and, but even earlier to Theodore Bovary, the observation that the timing of this event depended on something that was known, it was called the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio, that, uh, that is the ratio of something associated with the nucleus to something associated with the cytoplasm. Embryos of this kind, uh, early development, the egg is laid, the embryo the egg does not grow in size, the amount of cytoplasm is assumed con to be constant, but during nuclear replications, the number of nuclei and the amount of something associated with nuclei uh, doubles with each round. And so this increase in nuclei was thought to provide a clock that, uh, in, with respect that measured against this constant cytoplasmic volume, uh, uh, measured time and elicited a, uh, a mid-blastula uh, transition. One of the arguments for that is observations of haploid embryos, and this is something you can do in flies, genetically manipulate them such that they're haploid rather than diploid. And under those circumstances, while the diploid embryo would normally uh, divide until uh, and pause at cycle 14, a haploid embryo will undergo division, uh, one additional round of division and only enter the mid of the trans transition at cycle 15. What this means is that this embryo, by doubling the number of nuclei, has achieved the same nuclear cytoplasmic ratio as this embryo. And it was thought this was a strong argument that it is that ratio or some aspect of the ratio that provides the, the, the timing information. Now, um, that uh, argues for the existence of a ratio, but it doesn't actually tell you very much what that ratio is. What is the N in NC ratio? What is, the what is being measured in the nucleus? You can imagine that there's a single gene that's measured. You could imagine that there are multiple genes it's total DNA or total chromatin, you don't really know. And so uh, Schumann Liu in the lab several years ago developed a technology, a technique that was based basically in Drosophila genetics that involved using chromosomal rearrangements that, uh, to generate embryos that would have different amounts of DNA. You could be missing whole chromosomes or half of chromosomes, substitute chromosomes for other chromosomes, basically do a large scale analysis of manipulating DNA content and asking what is the, con what is the consequence on this timing event. And there are two major conclusions. One is that eliminating any region of the chromosome, which is a, a genome, which is something you can do in flies, does not of itself elic elicit an MBT. Uh, a mid uh, alter mid transition. There seems to be no specific region or gene, and we've eliminated the entire genome in different pieces and different combinations, that uh, 
would affect the MBT. The, what does affect the MBT is any particular combination of DNA contents that alters the actual amount of DNA in the egg. And so here's was her, uh, a set of her results where she's basically changed DNA content to 50, from 50%, which is essentially equivalent to haploids, uh, through, and you can go up 50, 60, 60, 70, like that. and what she was able to do is to identify a behaviors or genotypes where the embryos, even though they weren't strictly haploid, but had DNA contents that the embryo saw as being haploid and drove additional round, an additional round of division, or DNA contents that were so large that the embryo thought it was at the appropriate NC ratio one cell cycle earlier. So from those studies, what she was able to do was to identify a threshold content, which is about 70%. And interestingly, there was a very tight window around this, this content. That embryos above this threshold of 70%, you pause. Below it, you divide again. There's about a 5 to 7% change. So the embryos are able to measure about a 10% difference in DNA content and make absolute decisions. If you position the embryo exactly on this 70% variable, the, uh, you know, the, the, this, this threshold value, the behaviors of cells are somewhat variable. And they, uh, you can have individual embryos will do one or the other, or parts of embryos will do one, will decide, uh, will make decisions one way or the other. So this uh, told us that the cell cycle input was really substantially governed by this NC ratio. So then what Schumann went on to do was to look for transcription. And here she characterized transcription. And here was first really interesting and surprising phenomena that if you looked at newly transcribed genes, most of them, you know, they, most of them would become, uh, show a particular transcription level at cycle 14. But if you actually looked at them in haploids and diploids, you found that they actually broke into two classes. There's a class of genes which uh, would still come on at the normal level in cycle 13 or 14, as in whether they were in haploids and diploids, and we called these time-dependent genes. But there was another class of genes that when they came on, they came on in a uh, nucleocytoplasmic ratio uh, basis, such that a given cell cycle, uh, diploid 13 was characteristic of, of um, haploid 14, or diploid 14 was characteristic of, of, of haploid 15. So uh, this haploid embryos generally die. One of the reasons that we'd like to suggest now is not just simply that they're haploid, uh, these are inbred lines, they shouldn't have lethal factors, but one of the things that is happening in these embryos is that the, we are, because of the intermediate or uh, complicated transcriptional response, uh, they are gene expression patterns are thrown out of, out of sync with each other because some genes are coming on at the right time or some genes are coming on at the wrong time. Or, right or what right or wrong is depends on whether you think of absolute time or... Uh, so that's a, an idea to keep in mind for what actually happens in haploid embryos. <coughs> One thing that was true, though, from human studies is that if you went back and looked at these genetic manipulations where you had positioned embryos right at the threshold where a, the individual cells would have to decide, should I do another division, should I pause, or should I not? I don't know, I can't decide oh, what I'm going to do. I, you make a, they make a decision. Whatever decision they made with respect to the cell cycle matched precisely the decision that they made with respect to activating transcription of the NC ratio dependent gene. So here you can see uh, an embryo that where these have gone through an extra round of division and these have paused and thought these thought they were already at the right point to, to pause and turn on genes and these thought we have to go through another round of division and you look at the actual transcription products and what you can see is the ones that thought 
that, that are moved ahead, you know, developmentally, assume they're farther along, uh, activate transcription, and this is true on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So we can't find any discrepancies or any indication that, uh, that, there was, that disrupts the idea of an absolute cell-by-cell -cell tight correspondence between activation of transcription and um, uh, uh, the, the decision to pause in the cell cycle. Okay, now, uh, that so far though, all of what I've told you just effectively argues that there is a cell cycle pause, it's coordinated with the onset of major transcription, but it doesn't really tell you who's the boss or who is regulating uh, which, which of the process controls the timing. So you'd uh, like to know what the connection is between cell cycle uh, regulation and uh, transcriptional timing. And this is where Shelby Blythe's work came in. One of the things which uh, uh, standardly in the field were, uh, at the time was is a simple model. This is the textbook model for uh, uh, mid blastular transition control, again, that nuclei increase, and this nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is thought in some way to reflect, as you get more and more nuclei, it's harder and harder to replicate your DNA. There's not enough replicate substrates or some types of factors become limiting, and that elicits a replication stress or checkpoint that slows down cell cycle. And if you slow down the cell cycle, you pause, you introduce a G2, a, 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 something like a, a gap phase, a G2 or a G1, and that allows transcription. So in this model, the transcription is placed downstream of the, the cell cycle control. And that, I think, is, is, is still this, the standard model. What, uh, we are, uh, and that what fits with that model is that if you look, and what Shelby, one of the initial experiments that Shelby did was to develop uh, chromatin IP uh, strategies that allow looking at polymerase to pol 2 occupancy across the genome in single visually, uh, visually staged collections of embryos at cycle 12, cycle 13, cycle 14. And what is clear is that at cycle 13, at this point where you begin to see elongation of the cell cycle is actually the time where enormously across the genome you incorporate uh, or Paul uh, polymerase 2 is brought onto the promoters of all of these genes. So uh, it's an amazing thing actually of the uh, at cycle 12 you could identify maybe 300 uh, about 500 genes that were being transcribed at some low level, and 10 minutes later, at cycle 13, 3,000 uh, promoters had, uh, were now bound with polymerase. So this is a rapid change, and it's associated with this pause, this slowing in the cell cycle. So, but still, the resolution, the timing resolution of this experiment isn't enough to say who's the boss, because they're both happening at exactly the same time. The model uh, that Shelby, though, began to entertain was that, uh, that actually that was to investigate the, the possibility that rather than cell cycle governing transcription, that transcriptional onset governs the cell cycle transition. And I'm going to present two of his experiments here. One is that he redid and this kind of standard thing that we do in the lab of monkeying around with DNA contents and shifting them. And not surprisingly, this was an experiment he did by using X, different kinds of X chromosomes. And you could get a quite nice relationship uh, using checkpoint active as a, using duration of cycle 13 as a, a measure of checkpoint uh, activation. And you could see as you increase the um, amount of DNA, you got uh, a uh, 
a, a, a corresponding, uh, as the DNA, or you've approached the uh, content, the DNA content of wild type embryos, you got uh, closer to the characteristic uh, 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 duration of uh, cycle 13. So this is this typical kind of correspondence between DNA content and cell cycle time. But what, because he had done the polymerase localization, so you could actually go back and say, this is nice, but it's not a great correspond uh, curve. Maybe if we go back and look at all the chromosomes that we've manipulated here, but plot not total DNA content, but promoters that are, are, that are polymerase binding sites. And what you can see is suddenly the data becomes even more beautiful. So you get a better match when, uh, even though DNA content, which should reflect re uh, replication, gives you a good match, you get a much better match if you don't consider DNA replication directly, but you consider activation of transcription. And this raised the possibility that maybe there was something about transcription activation that actually causes stress for the DNA replication protocol. You're rapidly replicating your DNA. If you suddenly begin to transcribe genes, potentially that interferes with the DNA replication process and allows uh, produces stress that slows down the cell cycle. And that's going to be the model that we're going to investigate. To investigate that further, what Shelby did was develop markers for DNA uh, stress, GFP, that can be used in living embryos. This is RPA70. It's a report site of verification stress. And the idea of uh, the, this, is, this is replication stress and then the embryo. Uh, these, um, this protein will localize to sites of stalled uh, DNA replication. So then you can go back and you can use, use chromatin IP and ask, what are these? Where are these sites of stalled DNA replication? Where are the places? What's the difficulty here? And uh, remarkable uh, was that you could identify sites uh, in the sites of DNA replication stress are in fact identical to overlap with 80% the sites of active, that is, active genes. Wherever you have an active gene, a promoter, that's where, RNA, uh, that's where RPA70 accumulates. The accumulation is not perfect. It is always five prime to the transcribed gene in somewhere within uh, hundreds of nucleotides from the actual transcription start site from the binding site of RNA polymerase. So in our, that was that, was that co-localization specifically of stress to sites of transcription argued strongly that, that, that the transcription is probably, is, may be the input that's driving uh, accumulation of this protein, which then in turn activates the checkpoints. We can test that model by, oh, so that's the model. We're going to now say nuclear increase, that's true. There's some event that is involved in act transcriptional activation. And it's that event which elicits DNA replication stress, activates the checkpoint, slows the cell cycle, and then maybe you get more uh, uh, transcription. To test that model, what you'd like to do is say, well, if that's true, can we inhibit or block or slow transcription? And does that then alter the, the cell cycle? Can we, uh, or does, it, does eliminating transcription alter the, uh, or lowering transcription, does that lower the activation of the checkpoint? Does it lower DNA stress, replication stress? Uh, it's known in flies that uh, 
the transcriptional activation that occurs in these early embryos depends on uh, certain transcription factors that are called uh, Gaga fac uh, factors, and in particular, and a transcription factor called Zelda, which is a overall uh, thought to be involved in opening chromatin. What Shelby then did was to ask whether reducing transcriptional activation reduces replication stress. And the way that he, and this is actually an embryo which is mutant for the checkpoints. And if you're going to, uh, I should have, if you started the, and the embryo dies. If you don't, if you are under replication stress, but you don't have a checkpoint and you can't slow your cell cycle, you enter mitosis. Uh, and you can't even divide, you can't separate chromosomes, and you become really a mess. So this is the phenotype of not being able to respond to DNA stress by slowing the cell cycle. This is checkpoints to slow the cell cycle. So now uh, what you can do is take this same mutant background, but now we're going to lower the transcriptional activation. And what you can see is amazingly, the embryo will go through there. A slight little irregularity there, but clearly rescued. And 31% uh, of these embryos actually are rescued to full viability as adults. This is true for manipulating Zelda levels. It's also true for manipulating other inputs into transcriptional activation. Uh, the trithorax-like diffusion. These are all heterozy heterozygotes here. And again, 41 percent, you can suppress the requirement for a checkpoint if you just simply lower the rate or initiation of transcription. Embryos are not totally normal in terms of when they, you know, w there's some difficulties with respect to the, the cell cycle pausing, but they are remarkably, <laughs> well, they survive. Now, interestingly, if you, uh, we know from the literature that if you don't have the checkpoint, you are unable to slow down your cell cycle uh, during replication stress, and that causes lethality. You can, it had been known already, one way that you could suppress this uh, lethality was to alter cell cycle genes that would just automatically slow down the cell cycle. So even if you, you know, if you were, uh, whatever it was, uh, producing the stress, if you weren't able to divide so soon anyway, you would be rescued. And so rescuing, uh, uh, you can reduce cyclin B levels and alter the, the, the cell cycle behavior. But what's interesting is that when you use this technique, uh, this, these, this class of suppressors, you lengthen the cell cycle. Whereas when you, um, if you look at my 40, uh, the, the checkpoint mutants have a 13 minute cell cycle. By altering transcription, you don't change the cell cycle length at all. What you change is the need for a checkpoint. So, so far, what, we've, what we can see is that this have a model where activation of the genome is by recruitment of polymerase to these sites is what is driving the cell cycle and is what is controlling these developmental transitions. But just in a certain sense, it just pushes the question back one step farther, because you'd like to know what activates the genome. And to address that question, what we needed to begin thinking about was what governs general recruitment of RNA polymerase to promoters. And that raised the, 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 the realization that ultimately this is going to involve more broad, generalized changes in chromatin 
chromatin accessibility, chromatin structure, and that while these, this has been broadly characterized in fly embryos during early development, the available data was not good enough for us to follow on a cell with the time precision that we would really need to distinguish one cell cycle from the next. And so the next set of experiments were ones that involved um, actually trying to reconstruct the changes in chromatin. And the strategy that shall be adopted was a, a tech, it was basically a tech seek. Um, uh, basically, the way this technique, or all, there are many different ways for looking at chromatin accessibility. You can use uh, enzymes that digest available DNA. Or, or, uh, the attack seq works by incorporating uh, sequences into exposed DNA in non-fixed embryos, nuclei, and then processing uh, that DNA. Uh, processing using uh, PCR-based methods to amplify and identify regions that have incorporated, where, that were exposed and therefore could incorporate uh, those sequences. It's a powerful technique because it allows you to identify little short stretches which are actually analogous uh, sequences. <coughs> then when you sequence this DNA, you can map it onto the genome and that identifies sequences which are uh, defined broad open regions you know, of, of sh short fragments of DNA where multiple insertions could occur. It also so interestingly allows you to um, identify and map out nucleosome positioning because you go insertions, if you have a fixed nucleosome in a particular place, the insertions will happen either to one side or the other. So you can begin to see nucleosome uh, techniques. So it's an extremely powerful technique. From our standpoint though, the most amazing thing was it is of all the molecular techniques that we have, it's the one which is possible to use with a single visually staged embryo. So the plan of these experiments is to take individual embryos under a microscope, watch them. When they reach, enter mitosis, uh, wait two minutes, wait three, wait three minutes, and then process them within 10 to 15 seconds for the first step of this attack seek. So what, what Shelby is able to do in his, is to establish a time course of chromatin morphology at three minute intervals, visually staged through the whole cell cycles. And uh, The kind of data that you, you um, let's see, yeah. uh, you can you collect the data, seek you know the PCR the, 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 the products of the amplification, sequence them and map them back to the genome, and you can map them back to any particular gene. You can identify peaks. Here we're actually looking at two different the regions around two different genes, and what you can see is that at individual stages, there's a characteristic accum uh, uh, accumulation of sequences, that means regions where uh, chromatin is open, and you can map, uh, when you, since you're doing that on a particular gene, you can identify whether those open chromatin regions have, uh, when they arise, uh, sometimes they appear in this case to be constant open regions throughout the entire <coughs> cell cycle, other times new regions arise, regions are dynamic, and you can, for certain parts of the genome where we know as, for example, the hunchback <coughs> region where promoters and enhancers are, we can begin to relate these open regions to those, uh, to potential functions. So on the autosomes, which is for technical reasons where we've done most of the analysis, uh, the data over the three cell cycles identifies about a, a 10,000 10, open accessible sites. About a third of those are constant 
throughout the entire cell cycle. And about two-thirds undergo are what we call dynamic, in that they change over the, from one, from one three-minute interval to the next. Virtually all of the dynamic behavior that we see is an increase in accessibility. So what's happening during this time is think chromatin is opening up. If we look at uh, the known peaks <coughs> where we can identify and assign functions to, and that's about half of them, what we see is that all of these early peaks, which are the stable peaks, most of them are, those are substantially enhancers. Okay. Whereas the dynamic change, the thing that's happening between cycle 12 and 13, is a change in the accessibility of promoters and insulators. So the picture that you get from this is that the way the genome is built, or the way it exists at this stage, is that DNA is already organized. Enhancers are sitting there open, ready to bind transcription factors. The transcription factors, like biquate, and many of them are already there. They may well be bound, but the consequence of that binding at the, polymer, at the starts of transcription is what's actually being governed. And so you can actually look at the dynamic sites between uh, 12 and 13, and you can measure the enrichment at transcription sites, what, well, five prime, three prime to the gene, all genes, there's, but the overwhelming, you know, fraction of, of this dynamic behavior involves these starts of transcription. Uh, they, are, they result ultimately in the opening, we believe, in the poisoning of RNAs, of RNA polymerase, that then results in the stall, or in the, in the, replica, in the, the conflict with replication. There are other interesting things though, that come from the data. For me, the most amazing uh, result was that since he has single visually staged embryos, that he can follow through the cell cycle. He said once a given openness, a given feature was established, it was maintained. But it's not only maintained just through interphase, but when the cell enters mitosis and chromosomes condense, the interphase, this openness is maintained. So what this uh, begins to address what I think is a really fundamental problem in our thinking about chromatin, in that we know that epigenetic modifications are inherited, are passed from a mother cell to daughter cells, and we often wonder what's the nature of this inheritance, what's the nature of this memory. And we know also, and it's known in the literature, that well, there is some mechanism for memory and it could be complicated. You might mark DNA in some way. But this result suggests that we may be thinking about the process wrong. That actually you, since the taxi recognizes physically open, available structure, DNA structure, you don't need memory. It tells us that when we look at uh, mitotic chromosomes like these that are so highly condensed, what we, probably what we don't see, in my view, is lots of little loops of accessible chromatin that are just hanging off of the surface that are preserved from the previous interphase and when this chromosome decondenses, are still there. There are more subtle changes. Um, what you can, and actually you can spend a lot of time <laughs> going through data like this, saying how things, peaks, individual peaks change. And, and there's these things are actually interesting. Um, we can follow 
transcription in fly embryos, in living embryos, using an MS2 uh, situation. We can actually use, study the hunchback locus that we're looking at here, and we can follow as the embryos enter interphase what the occurrence and intensity of the, of, of, of the transcription response is. It peaks at the end of interphase, uh, uh, at, at end of interphase, beginning of prophase, and then drops at metaphase. We can run that in parallel with chromatin accessibility, and what you can see is that the increase in chromatin accessibility does in fact relate to transcriptional activity, but when you enter mitosis and RNA polymerase and uh, is no longer there and you no longer detect transcription, you maintain the openness of those transcription start sites. The thing which actually most efficiently disrupts chromatin is DNA replication. So you can follow DNA replication using the uh, a, a visual marker and plot out the accumulation of or the, the, the levels uh, replica replication begins immediately after entry into mitosis, and that's associated with a disruption, a lowering of the accessibility, which then once you've completed DNA replication, you can begin to uh, establish and increase the levels. So lastly, we um, which, so now we have an event, chromat a change in chromatin accessibility. So what you'd like to know is what governs that event. It's something that happens between cycle 11 and cycle 12. And I will tell you that mechanistically we don't know quite what governs that event yet, but what we can ask is how does it relate to the timers that we talked about before. So what we can go back and do is do the experiment in, um, with uh, changes in the uh, looking at chromatin accessibility, but ask how the dynamics of chromatin accessibility change in haploid embryos versus diploid embryos. And ask, there's two possibilities. You can imagine that the since we know that there are timers, there are time-independent de genes and their nucleocytoplasmic ratio independent genes, we know also that um, this uh, one possibility is that um, chromatin changes are, just naturally occur at cycle 11, but what the NC ratio is measuring is something else. So you get your, uh, you change your chromatin accessibility, but what actually drives polymerase incorporation or something else is some other feature. And so to address that, uh, we have uh, uh, repeated these experiments. And essentially, these are become complicated experiments because you're comparing wild-type embryos, diploid embryos, with haploid embryos. And what you expect is the question that you'd like to ask is, uh, is the, in a diploid, there's a certain characteristic configuration of chromatin, certain openness pattern, and is that equivalent to uh, the, say, a, an openness pattern uh, behavior at cycle 12, is that equivalent to the openness pattern in a haploid at cycle 13? Is there a delay in one cycle, or does the process, um, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, dependent on some other feature? And the, the results are interesting, actually, and I haven't been able to, because these are last week's results. <laughs> so uh, this, I, I haven't quite put this together in my mind. But the interesting thing is, and this happens to us sometimes when you do science, is the answer falls somewhere halfway between the two, the two alternatives that you had. I wanted to see either time dependence, absolute time dependence, or absolute cell cycle dependence. And what is happening is that the genes and regions, 
break into two groups. There are some regions whose accessibility, and these represent about 30% of the new peaks, are what we call time dependent. In the, at cycle 12, the chromatin opens up, the, 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 the transcription site opens up, whether it's, um, a, um, whether it's in a haplate or a diploid, so independently of nucleocytoplasm. And then the remaining 70% show a behavior which is basically nucleocytoplasmic ratio dependent. That those, promote, those promoters those shift and become uh, a rise only one cycle later in haplites. Now, we don't know very much about the mechanism here, but one thing that is striking is if you look at those promoters and you look for regions of um, transcriptional you know, binding sites for other, uh, for, other uh, other fact, uh, for, for other transcription factors, what we see is that there's all a clear, if once you can group genes into two classes, you can begin to see differences in the, the kinds of, of transcription factors that are, that are bound or, or whose, whose sites are most prevalent there. So this begins to give us a handle potentially on what is the difference, what are the timing, what controls time, what is the input, and what are the sensors for nucleocytoplasmic ratio. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to stop right now. And what I'm not going to do is tell you about any other, I'll just, about the other thing that we were, I had anticipated doing, uh, talking about, but I, I, you've been such an attentive audience, I think we should maybe stop for a quick, but I will tell you just briefly what you might have heard, or maybe if I get to see you in a couple of years, I'll be able to give an even more intellectually coherent <laughs> presentation of the second half of this talk, which was really directed at um, this transcriptional activation and the role as enhancers are sitting there available and promoters open up. We know that the pattern, the spatial pattern, depends on graded transcription factors like bicoid that activate transcription from different genes at different concentrations. So presumably, it is the role of the enhancers for each of these genes to sense concentration in terms of binding affinities probably and, and, and regulate the activation of transcription in one region of the embryo because uh, those transcription, uh, because those enhancers have a high affinity so even very low concentrations of bicoid will activate expression versus another gene that's only expressed at the anterior region of the embryo where you have high affinities. So what we're starting to do is to develop lines and assays that allow us to measure affinities of the bicoid protein, concentration-dependent affinities on a global level. So the difficulty is that if you have a, a wild-type embryo, it has, every cell has a different concentration. And so what we've done is to invent or molecularly generate embryos which have no endogenous bicoid but have a flat level distribution of bicoid protein uniformly across the embryo but at different levels. And then what Colleen Hannan is doing is chip seek on each of these stocks and then asking how, as you change the concentration of bicoid, how does the are there enhancers that respond and bind bicoid only at high concentrations or low or intermediate? How many levels can we identify? And are there molecular features to those levels? So I'm going to, uh, and I will say that we're doing those experiments and they're kind of working, but we don't have, we have even less an idea of what's going on. <laughs> I just want to end with the title slide though. Uh, to emphasize that, while it is true that in the lab I actually do work 
four to five hours a day at the bench. I, like all scientists, you know, my experiments aren't always so successful. And if you only work four hours a day, you're not going to get anywhere inside. Look, people out there, hear me? You need more than four hours a day to be truly successful. But, you know, I'm like the dog. You know, the, the, you know, the dogs that run through the, the, the neighborhood, a whole pack of dogs, and there's the really old dogs that have to sit up on the porch and look nostalgically at the dogs <laughs> that are running through the neighborhood. And then I'm one of those dogs that's still out there kind of running along with the, trying to keep up with the pack. But um, it's, uh, yes. <laughs> but it is a great pleasure to run with the pack and do experiments every day. These, most of the experiments I talked about today were done by uh, Shelby Blythe. I talked about some early work by Shu and Lu that set up the whole problem of dosage compensation in the embryo for us. And I didn't have a chance to tell you in detail about Colleen Hannon's work on bicoid uh, and concentration dependence. But I'll stop there. And thank you for your <laughs>